You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back to the show. As always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we're joined by Stephen Pesavento, who is the founder of Von Finch Capital and the host of the Investor Mindset. So I was introduced to Stephen by a friend over at the Two Smart Assets uh, podcast a couple weeks ago. We had a chance to chat last week, and I just found Stephen to be a uh, super interesting and had a great story and I just couldn't wait to share it with you guys. So Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with you guys. I love your show and uh, I'm excited to be able to speak to your listeners. Awesome. Stephen, can you give us a little background where you came from, how you got into real estate investing, what you're doing today? Yeah, yeah. So my name is Stephen Pesavento. I'm the founder of Von Finch Capital and the host of the Investor Mindset Podcast and Investor Mindset Community. And I help investors make big changes in their life, whether that's from passive investors who have already figured out how to make lots of money and they're looking to create more flexibility and freedom, or for those operators, those entrepreneurs who are looking to get into the business and be able to scale up quickly, how they can uh, do that and exactly the path that they're able to take. But it's been a wild road. I started out, I, I flipped over 200 houses in single family, raised you know millions of dollars. And I focus on investing in multifamily apartments. And you know it's so interesting. The funny thing is when I was growing up, I wanted to be one of two things when I was a kid. I either wanted to be a chef like Emeril Lagasse or I wanted to <laughs> renovate property like Bob Vila. <laughs> and I'll tell you all that HGTV definitely paid off because, you know, after, uh, after a career in management consulting, I've gone all in to the real estate world. Awesome. What, uh, what fueled the switch going from flipping a bunch of houses now over to multifamily? You know, it's so interesting because it actually starts a little bit earlier when I was a kid, I had, of course, two amazing loving parents, but there was one thing that was always consistent, though really almost the only thing consistent, you know, at being the oldest of four kids from multiple divorces, moving seven times before I was 13. Uh, but that one thing that was consistent was that money had one feeling and emotion connected to it, and that was pain. And I can remember when I was a kid, I walked in, you know, to the kitchen when I was about 15, I remember my dad crying about money again. And, you know, I just, I decided then and there that I was going to be rich, that money was not going to be a problem. And so I started hustling, doing everything that I could possibly do to make a buck from, you know, selling paintball gear online to even selling booze out of my trunk. And, you know, some <laughs> of the things may not have been the best in retrospect, but it got me to my end goal of making money and making a lot of it. And I went that traditional route. I, you know, I followed the traditional path. I went to university. I went to a great university, St. John's, and I graduated and got into management consulting. And I thought, you know, I'm going to have it set. I'm making more money than my parents ever have. And I am taken care of. But I realized then and there after a couple of years of management consulting that one, I was missing that passion. And two, money solves a lot of problems, but it didn't solve all of them. And so I kind of went on this journey to start looking to find work that I could both be passionate about, that I could make an impact doing, and that I could also still make a lot of money. But I really started doing a lot of personal development. And that eventually led me back towards real estate. You know, at 17, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it took 10 years before those concepts uh, allowed me to have the confidence to make the decision to go all in. And once I did, I ended up just realizing that I'd found my tribe and you know, all of that things, all of those ideas, everything ended up coming together, you know, when I finally decided to go all in. Awesome. So a lot of stuff there that I love hearing and, and I want to hear more about a few different areas. So first of all, that's awesome that you were exposed to rich dad, poor dad at, at 17. You know, I didn't read it till I was 27, but you made me feel a little bit better when you said that it took you 10 years to act on it. So I'm going to feel like I didn't miss the boat too much. Um, <laughs> The other thing I want to know about is your transition from the traditional route to going all in, right? Because a lot of folks, you know, real estate is their, their side hustle and, 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 you know, there's a lot of economic insecurity around leaving a W2 job that has the benefits and all the, you know, security to go pursue an entrepreneurial lifestyle. 
And I'm just wondering, you know, coming, especially coming from your background, a humble beginnings, being around economic insecurity, I, I imagine it cut even deeper um, with you. And I'm just wondering what kind of emotions and, and what kind of like practical, you know, mindset shifts did you go through throughout that process and how long were you doing you know both at the same time and at what point did you switch over and to just kind of walk us through that a absolutely well it's such a good question and you know that economic insecurity definitely cuts deep it's still something i have to work through today even while making great income and money it's like you have a loss or you have something and, and it ends up bringing you back to that feeling uh, of oh what happens if it's all gone but that's just a constant, that's just a constant process until you end up building enough security internally that no matter what happens in that external world, you got it. But for me, I went from management consulting into technology, into the startup space, eventually started uh, you know, a startup, had a fail attempt on that startup, many great things came out of it. Um, but it was through each of these instances that I got more and more secure, more and more comfortable with that uncertainty that entrepreneurship brings with it, right? And so when I finally got to the place of jumping into real estate and doing it 100%, I can remember exactly where I was. I had just had this massive moment of clarity and that clarity had led me to this place of feeling 100% ready to step into whatever it was that life was gonna bring me. And I remember I was you know, watching uh, TV with a, a girlfriend at the time and I jumped up off the couch and I said, you know what, not another day, I'm doing this right now, I'm committing 100%. And that day I ended up sending a message to my existing clients. I was managing uh, uh, digital marketing and web development and I transitioned them all that day to someone else and essentially cut off all of their ways of making income. Now, I don't recommend other ships. people do that, but I burned the boats because in that moment, I knew I had to take action. I had to go forward. And I decided the, the very first event, I know I needed to get myself in community around other people who were doing this. So that week, I had a, a real estate meetup on my calendar and I went there with intention and with the intention of connecting with somebody who I could learn from. And so I did all the research on the speaker. I listened to podcasts. I dug in and I figured out uh, by answering this question, how can I be of value to this person? How can I make a difference in this person's life? What can I do to be able to make an impact for that person to want to invite me into their inner circle? And I approached that person at this event. It's a story I've told many times, but I, I walked up and I made this offer and it was an offer this person couldn't refuse, an irresistible offer before I could even get finished offering to, you know, build this person a $10,000, $15,000 website, their hand was struck out, they're ready to accept it. And all I had asked in return was the ability to follow them around to be able to ask, ask them some questions along the way. And that first connection ended up awesome. teaching me so much about real estate that it allowed me to show up as a person who was quickly learning within the community so that other people took notice, other people recognized that I was using the lingo, that I was taking action, that I was making you know, hundreds of offers and many, many phone calls that I then got accepted and pulled in through other mentors and friends before I finally paid for some mentorship and really accelerated myself towards you know, that first year of flipping over 75 houses within those first 12 months. So when did you start flipping houses? 2016. 2016. Okay. Awesome. So do you feel like somebody to start flipping houses in 2021 would be the same as somebody starting in 2016? I'm just, you know, we, we're, we're what I assume would be the tail end of a 10 year, you know, hike here. And I'm just wondering, do you advise, obviously you personally have moved into multifamily, but do you advise people at this point in the market um, where deals seem to be harder to come by and we seem to be topping out? Do you advise people to get into flipping houses these days or, or what's your kind of thought process around house flipping in our, our current economy? My thought process is everything's relative. And here's what's so important about that statement that I just made is that if you were to ask someone in 2016, what do you, Mr. Experience Investor, think is going to happen in the next six to 12 to 18 months? I've been told my entire career 
that the entire economy is going to fall out in the next 18 months. Yeah. And the entire time that I was building that business, the economy was on, on the edge of being ready to fall over. And if anything, it's only gotten stronger and stronger. Now that doesn't mean that I don't still think that it's going to go into a direction of difficulty or challenge. I just think that we don't really know, we can't predict. Now I did make a transition out. One of the many reasons, not the number one reason, I'm happy to talk about why I transitioned. But one of the reasons was that when you're dealing with things on a short-term basis, it's good because you can quickly get in and out of properties, but it's bad because you don't have a long runway in case the world does change to be able sure. to change with it. In other words, oftentimes when you're flipping houses, your debt, or your loan or your investments short are on a six or 12 month short-term basis. And that's where people really lose big is when they have short-term debt and they're not able to make those payments. So because of that, because I'm a real big believer in building security and building consistent income, multifamily is so much stronger. And I actually think that one of those limiting beliefs that I had back then, because I wanted, I read ABCs of real estate investing from Ken McElroy, and oh, I had the same point. limiting beliefs I did 10 years before about getting into real estate. You can skip directly past the single family route and jump directly into multifamily, no problem. And I can tell you exactly how to do that, who to do it with, how to be able to take those steps. Definitely reach out to me if you're looking for some advice on that because I've done it. But uh, I do think the benefit of single family is it's a lower barrier to entry. You'll have a success uh, feeling of success much quicker and anybody can do it. But because of that, because of that, it ends up meaning a lot of people are jumping into it. And I think there's a lot more opportunity in the multifamily space as a result. So tell us, you, you opened the door for it. Why, why did you make the transition? What did the transition look like? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's such a good question. Why would somebody who's running a business where they're flipping 75 houses a year, where they have systems and processes and a team in place to buy five to seven houses every month, where they're making more money than they've ever made in their life, why would they decide to transition away from a business like that? And the answer is simple. It's because I practice what I preach. And what I did was I went through this process of getting very clear on what I wanted and really, really clear on why that's important. And in that process of understanding what do I want, I looked at my business and I started recognizing that the business that I'm running today is not the business that I want to be running in 20 years that the clients that I'm serving today are not the clients that I want to serve in 20 years. And so what it was specifically was, you know, imagine you're spending five, 10, $15,000 per customer to be able to get a deal under contract. And it's a one-time sale. And to me, I just looked at that and I thought, okay, well, we've done such a good job at this. How can we change the business so that we can serve someone who is growth minded, who has that mindset and really believes that they can create a better life? How can I surround myself with people who have that drive and that tenacity to go out and do amazing things in the world versus someone who's selling their house at 70 cents on the dollar is in a survival mode. Nothing wrong with that. We've all go through that at some point, hopefully less people go through it than maybe I did, or maybe you did. But the truth is the folks that I was serving were not the people that I wanted to serve. So I ended up looking at my business. I started making some changes, some tweaks. And I realized over a process of elimination that the business I was in, I would need to uh, transition into the business that I wanted to be. So I was at the top of one peak and I looked up and I realized, well, this is phenomenal, but that is where I must go. And so I started down this journey of going down the mountain and then back up, right? So that I could transition knowing that by taking that step backwards, I'd actually be able to take 10 steps forward so much faster. And over the 18 months of since making that decision, we've been able to rapidly grow our business and the most important thing comes back to this ideal customer, right? If, if you're super clear on who you serve and why you're going to serve them, it becomes that much easier. So for me, my business is all about serving people who are committed to creating a better life, who are committed to growth, who believe it's possible to grow, who are interested in changing those thoughts and beliefs, who, who want to create a better picture of their future, that freedom, flexibility, the fun, everything that everyone's going after, and that they either fall into one of these two buckets. They're either people who want to create a career out of this, 
entrepreneurs who want to make multifamily or real estate their business. And there's ways that I'm able to help them do that through the lessons I've learned. And most importantly, through the partners that I have, because I'm a big believer and partner with experts to be able to show them, hey, this is the path. But then majority of my business is focused around the people who've already found work that they are fulfilled by, that they're passionate by, and most importantly, that they make a lot of money. So other successful people just like me who want to invest passively into uh, commercial real estate to be able to get that benefit that real estate offers without having to focus their effort and energy there, those folks partner with us at Von Finch. And what's so cool about these two places coming together is I essentially get to surround myself with all the people that I want to spend all of my time with anyways. And now my whole business sure. is built around serving this, this person that is just like me, who's committed to growth. And together, we get to make a huge impact in the world, not only in their financial uh, and you know fun and flexibility in their life, but also through all of the carry-on effect that happens through the work that we do. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. Love it. So where does Von Finch uh, Capital invest primarily? Yeah, so we've got a, a, a really phenomenal model. So at the core of our model is we really believe in partnering with experts across the board. You know, like I mentioned, my first business partnered with an expert who had, you know, flipped uh, many houses and built hundreds of houses. And together we were able to scale up to 75 houses a year that first year, because I brought in skill sets that I had. He brought in skill sets that he had. And we, we, you know, tripled, quadrupled, you know, nearly 10 X the number of properties that he had done in a year together. And so our business is really built around two things. We go and find amazing deals in markets that are growing, that have population growth, job growth. And then we bring our investors and our, our very, very strong investor network to the table. And we go and find an operator, someone who's got 10 years plus of experience, who's an expert in that market. And together we acquire that property and we execute that business plan and we give up some of our upside so that they sure. can be truly incentivized to operate and do the day to day in that business. And we all succeed when we all succeed. And so the markets that we look at, we love the Southeast. We have some properties in Jacksonville. We have uh, a fund that we're working with a very institutional player in Dallas. We love the Denver market. There's multiple other markets that we really like across the Sun Belt. Uh, you know, great cities like uh, Nashville to, uh, you know, from Nashville to Atlanta, to Houston, to Dallas, to Denver, to a bunch of other cities in between, uh, that we really like, but at the core for us, it's really about finding great partners. And then we go out and find great properties to work with them on. And so that's a little bit about how we do and, and really where we're doing it, but it comes down to where are people moving to and where are we going to continue to see that growth so that you know, we're able to execute a great business plan, but then just the environment ends up adding so much upside to the deal that we're not even underwriting to. Absolutely. I love how you focus on what you do best. You know, a lot of times I think people try and like figure out how to you know, increase the areas where they, you know, they're not awesome rather than like tripling down on like what they are good at. But I, I, if you look at any real successful people out there, real successful organizations, what you'll find is people doing exactly what you are tripling down on sounds like with you is the, the network building and the capital raising tripling down on that and spending all of your time and energy committed to that. And then partnering with somebody else who spends all of their time and energy absolutely committed to being the best possible operator. I think when you have some people out there that don't like to share and don't like partnerships, want to go out there and do everything themselves. I, I don't know. I just feel like sometimes they're juggling too many balls. I mean, I, I would, I'd feel more comfortable investing with an operator who does nothing but operate and focus on being the best operator mm. versus somebody who's over here, raising capital over here, trying to juggle this. You know what I mean? So I, I love your model. Absolutely. I think it's um, I think it's a great, a great way to approach this business. Um, and I like to see people specializing in that manner. Well, it's interesting because syndication is a group investment. And so when you have people who have that value, you can see it when you talk to them that they are, they're so focused on getting their own. Uh, they got to keep everything for themselves. And what they end up doing is they kind of, they, they really, 
limit their possibilities and capabilities because they're so focused on keeping everything for themselves. But if you really truly believe that the world is abundant of opportunities and that there's more than enough money to go around, there's more than enough investments and there's more than enough deals and we're going to find the next one. Uh, if you really have that belief and you end up working with somebody who also has that belief, which is key for us, finding people who have our shared values, we can go out. I, how long is it going to take me to get 10 years of experience in real estate managing multifamily? 10 years. Do right. I want to wait 10 years to try to become the best on the ground operator and then still maybe not be the best because I've got some skill sets that are better elsewhere? And same for the passive investors, right? If you see people who are so focused on holding everything just for themselves, and they don't have even an ounce of that abundance mindset, what are they going to be doing for you as a passive investor, right? If everything is focused on how one person can do everything and they don't, they're not interested in sharing the wealth uh, you know, between the people who are executing and creating value, then it's not going to be a great partnership for everybody involved. But the idea behind a group syndication and, or a, a group investment, aka a syndication, is that, you know, our passive investors, our partners, they're bringing value to the table with the capital that they provide. And as a result, they receive a large, oftentimes majority of the upside in the deal. And, you know, the operators executing day to day, and, you know, we're finding the deal. And, you know, we're bringing the capital and everyone together adds value to the table uh, that we're setting together so that we can all sit down and eat. Um, and I really think that it's just, it's a better way to do business. And it's something that it's a lot more fun for me than trying to figure it all out on my own. I, I wrote an ebook the other day and the, the whole premise behind it was, I, I don't, uh, people get caught up in how sexy being an active investor is, but I don't think people really give credit to how awesome being a passive investor is. Mm. So, you know, it's no secret that if you run around and do all the work and you're, you know, you're putting the deal together, you, you make, you know, a higher return, you know, especially cause it's your sweat equity, not your like cash dollars going into it. But mm from a passive investor standpoint, like most of the deals that are going around today, you're looking at like a five, like a 20% average annual for five years. I mean, that's doubling your money every five years. If you're double and you're, you're working at your day job where you're making a killing and that's why you're not actively involved. If you're doubling your money every five years on a tax deferred basis, I mean, you could turn 200 grand into 1.5 million in 15 or 20 years. Like that, while you're killing it at your day job and you're not, you know, you're diversifying your risk. Like people that think real estate investing is sexy, I really think need to focus more on that long-term strategy versus I'm going to go flip a house. You know, um, I don't think it gets enough attention. It's amazing what we do for passive investors. Making cash flow is sexy. Making back end equity growth while you're going and doing everything that's important in your life spending time with your family, traveling, working, whatever it is that ends up lighting you up, that's sexy. And that's the thing that we should really be promoting. I mean, entrepreneurship has definitely gotten very popular and it's look is like a very attractive it's thing. A but it's a lot of right, work. <laughs> but it's not the right fit for a lot of people. There's a lot of uncertainty in it. And there, it, it does take a lot of work. I mean, I love what I do. So I'll spend 16 hours a day working and I'll work the weekends and I don't mind doing it because I absolutely love it. But do I always do that? No. Do, have I created the flexibility to be able to, you know, go to Hawaii for 20 days and just take off and have no problem, you know, checking an email every couple of days or something? Yeah, I can do that. But I also don't, I also love what I do. So it's not, it's not like I'm just grinding away in this uh, thing. And a lot of people are, it's just not a good fit for. And I mean, we, I, yeah. so I put together this, this great resource called the Passive Investor Playbook. But within it, I, I remember writing and, you know, you're talking about, you know, valuable content. And it's like, I remember going through here and I'm, I'm writing this document, right? It's 52 plus pages. It's very valuable. There's a lot of information on doing due diligence, on picking operators, on, you know, the details of what goes into a syndication, how to pick these things. But I'm going through it and I'm thinking, man, I love the fact that I'm on the active side because I just enjoy working with all these people. But the real benefit is being a passive investor. The real upside, the goal of nearly every active investor is to have a big enough pot of money that they are able to mostly passively invest. Sure. Because passively investing, you receive you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% of the upside on a deal and you're not doing any work, right? You might have a higher overall return percentage if you're the one who's in there doing all the work every single day. 
but your time return on time is so much sure. better from a passive investing standpoint. But if you guys want a copy of that, uh, I'll share it with you guys here. It's at the investor mindset.com slash passive. You can download that passive playbook. And I'm sure Sterling will include that in the show notes Absolutely. for people to be able to download the investor mindset.com slash passive. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll definitely put that in the show notes. So what advice do you have for anybody out there looking to get started? Yeah. The biggest advice that I have really comes from these five principles of success after interviewing hundreds of amazing investors and thought leaders on the investor mindset, you know, from people like Chris Voss, uh, who wrote the book, Never Split the Difference, to Mark Manson, who wrote the book, The Subtle Art, to, you know, great investors like Joe Fairless, and so many other uh, top level investors. What I realized is once you dive in to the mindset of success, you realize that mindset is just the the thoughts and beliefs that directly lead to the actions that we take in our life and therefore the outcomes that we experience. And if we can change those thoughts and beliefs, if we can upgrade our thinking, we can eventually see different action, which ends up resulting in different outcomes. So it's very simple. And so one of the biggest things that I learned and that uh, been able to share in those five principles of success is it really comes down to getting clear on what you want. It's so simple. People hear about it all the time, but I'm going to tell you what, they don't do it. People are not getting clear. How do I know that? Because I'm one of them. And from time to time, I fall into a place where I'm not working from that level of clarity, right? It doesn't happen as much anymore, but it does happen. It might happen for a few hours on a day where I'm working for a few hours and I'm not really clear what I'm doing, or maybe it's a whole day or God forbid it's a week or God forbid it's a month or Many people are going their whole life without being clear on what they want. But when you just simply sit down and you get clear, what do I want for my life? What do I want for my investments? What do I want for my career? What do I want? And when you just get clear on what you want, especially when it comes to getting started investing, you'll start to understand more about what that picture looks like. And when you can paint a vivid picture, when you can get that vision clear, you can start to see the opportunities that are around you every single day. Because if you get clear on what you want, now, of course, you want to get clear on your purpose, your why, because that's the driver, that's the motivation, that's the thing that's going to keep you in the pocket when things get really tough. But without getting clear on what you want, you could be you know, navigating throughout life and you're going to miss the fact that there's all these signals all around you telling you, oh, hey, well, if you go over here, you can actually get what you want. Or if you go over here, you can actually get what you want. So you got to get, you got to start there. And when you get clear on what, the next step is actually not anything. It's not figuring out how you're going to get there. It's actually who, you know, what you want, who is going to help you get there, who can support you, who's got the information. Maybe it's tuning into a rent roll radio with Sterling and diving into some lessons and some thoughts and some, some strategies that are going to help you. Maybe it's going out and finding a coach or a mentor. Maybe it's finding a investment firm who you're going to passively invest with. Maybe it's, it's whatever it could be. It comes down to who else already has the information, the beliefs, the, the roadmap for you to get where you want. And once you get clear on what, and you understand who's going to get you there, uh, who can help you get there, and you're willing to invest, whether that's time, money, partnership, whatever that effort might be with experts, it's going to completely change your life because everything else will fall into place after that. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Uh, real quick, I want to hop over to our radio round, help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. What is your, it's just three quick questions. What is your favorite book? Uh, my favorite two books are The Go-Giver, which is okay. a phenomenal book. If you haven't read it, dive into it. It's all about the idea that you give without expectation of receiving, that you'll actually in the long run get everything you ever wanted in the world. And the second book, which is a brand new book, but it, it builds on one of my core philosophies that I've been talking about for years is a book from Dan Sullivan called uh, Who Not How. It's I'm a book all about- I'm in the middle of it right now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, it's so good that I, I'm on my third read of it because every time I listen to it, it ends up reminding me, oh, that's right, that's right. I need to figure out who I need not how I'm going to get there. And I'm someone who's been evangelizing this for years. I'm someone who's been a big believer in hiring great people and partnering with experts. But it's these little things. It's by going back through these books and being reminded of these philosophies and keeping them at the forefront of your mind that you can end up uh, getting so much more out of it every time you uh, take it for a listen. 
Absolutely. What is your favorite quote? One of my favorite quotes, there's so many great ones, but one of my favorite ones comes down to a quote all about community. It's all about the people that you spend your time with. It's all about why it's so important to spend your time with great people. And it's from Jim Rohn. And it's, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. So you get to decide who do you want to be and look around. Are the people that you're surrounded with, are they in alignment with that? Or are you the biggest fish in that pond? Absolutely. And you said something earlier that I, I, I wanted to point out, and, and I, it, it goes along with the comment you just made about, are you the biggest fish in that pond? You said you made a comment about stepping back to step forward, about making the transition from, from house flip into multifamily. Um, you know, it's easy to get stuck in what we're good at, right? I was really good at residential. Everybody who looks at me in, in residential go, oh, wow, he's really got his stuff together. He's great. And it feeds my ego. And it's easy to be in those rooms and be like the mm -hmm. smartest guy and, and soak all that up. But when I go into like a Joe Fairless conference, I'm like the dumbest guy in that room. I'm the least accomplished mm -hmm. person there. And it's a, it's a very big ego hit. And I have to go, you know, very like, um, timidly ask for help. And it's, um, it's great to consistently put yourself in situations where you're not, you know, um, I, another thing that reminds me, I, I do triathlon or I used to do triathlons. I probably hadn't done one in three years, but um, I, we started me and my, my brothers and my dad, we started doing marathons and we'd run several marathons and we're like, Oh, we're going to go do a triathlon. So I was like, well, I mean, I run marathons. I can swim. You know, I, I get in the pool and I can't make it from one side of the pool to the other without stopping, mm. like getting up and gasping for air. So I had to go mm. to like, like swim lessons you know, like mm. there's like little seven-year-olds in three lanes over. And here I am an accomplished marathon runner. I have to take swim lessons to just to be able to swim the 1.2 miles of the, the race. But um, I just think, I think, you know, people need to stay humble enough to constantly put themselves in those situations that will foster their growth. It's by going and being in those situations that end up making the biggest change. And I'll tell you a very short story. If, if, you'll indulge me on this. And it's an experience that I had when I was about 19 going on 20, but there's an incredible organization. And back in World War II, when the U-boats were driving around uh, in England and in the area, they were shooting down all these boats from military boats to, uh, to you know, boats bringing different cargo and things like that. And all these English sailors, lots of them were dying. And was it the old crusty sailors who've been on the boat for many years that were dying or was it the young newbies? It was the young newbies. It was the newbies who didn't know what they were capable of were giving up and they were dying at the highest rate. And so the British government went searching, how are we going to be able to keep these people alive? How are we gonna be able to show them and give them an experience of, of what life is and really be able to push them beyond their current beliefs. And so an organization called Outward Bound was born, which is an outdoor education uh, organization that's really designed to be able to put people into extremely difficult situations and scenarios and be able to push them beyond their beliefs. And so I went and did this when I was 19. It was a 30 day backpacking trip, you know, hiked hundreds of miles in Colorado and uh, with no connection to the outside world you know, no, you completely off the map for 30 days. But that experience is the same kind of experience, the same reason why some of the most successful CEOs or the highest number of percentage of people are running the Ironman happen to be very, very successful. It's because when you put yourself in an extremely difficult situation, you get stronger. It's not, it's, 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 you think you'd get weaker, you think it would take away, but it actually makes everything else run that much better. And so it's just such a good reminder that if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling like you're uncomfortable, that's great, right? Because yeah. that means there's an opportunity for us to grow and to be better. Absolutely. I love it. Stephen, where can our uh, listeners find out more about you, get in touch with you, learn from you, connect with you? Yeah. So grab that resource. We talked about the investor mindset.com slash passive. I encourage you, if you liked what we talked about on this show, we talk a lot about mindset and real estate investing and be able to make a career out of it, being able to passively invest on the investor mindset podcast. You can find the investor mindset on any of your podcasting apps. Um, of course, uh, I encourage you if you're listening to this show and you do want to get in touch directly with me, you know, go find me on social media, your favorite social media, 
of choice and send me a DM and let me know that you're listening to me right here on Sterling's show. And me or someone from my team will, uh, will get in touch with you and we'll be able to point you in the right direction about how we can help. Awesome. Steven, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed it. I know our listeners will love it. And um, we look forward to, to following everything you're out there doing and, and keeping up with you on your journey. Ah, it's so awesome. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and look forward to the next time we get to hang out. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at RentRollRadio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at RentRollRadio.com or Sterling at CrestworthCapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.